This is a miscellany about Aaron, mainly the history in terms of archaeology and geology, but one or two other odds and ends of things that are quite interesting. I start with this Glen Sanex. First came on to Aaron Run in 1957. And I came on her for the first time in 1957. She was the very first uh, car uh, ferry on the island. And one of the things I noticed uh, when I was there was that there were water rats in the Rosa Burn at the north end of Brodick. And they were <laughs> getting killed in their dozens because they were completely without knowledge of traffic. There were so few cars on the island that uh, the, um, the rats were being killed <laughs> en masse. <laughs> Um, that ferry also uh, had a very, very good record for not getting stopped by weather or anything else. There were only three or four days in its entire run of, of ten, over 10 years when it didn't sail. Aaron, I kind of assuming everyone will know where it is. It's the largest island in the Firth of Clyde, the, the most southerly of the Western Islands, if you count it as one of the Western Islands. Um, but it's known as Scotland in miniature because it has got so much variety um, of topography due to its very complicated geology, which is why I'm starting with the geology, because it does kind of lean into it. Um, you can see more or less that it is crossing, um, it's kind of divided across the middle. The North Island is very, very um, rocky, and the southern bit is much more agricultural. <coughs> When you come onto the island for the first time, you are faced with this, which is known as the sleeping warrior. Um, that's his head and his hands on his stomach and his feet sticking up. And it is the what's left of a great mound of tertiary intrusion. That's the um, goat fell, which is the tallest um, mountain on the island. It's a corbett. It's not quite a Monroe although I tend to feel that's cheating a bit, because when you climb uh, Goat Fell, you are climbing from about 100 feet above sea level. It's a long, long haul. Um, when you get up, you can get here. Now, you can either turn around and go back, or you can go across this bit, which is called the saddle, and down into Glen Sanox. And it's a nice day's run if the weather's half decent. Um, you, however, you must, you must be, know where you're going. Because if you take a wrong turning in this area here, you will end up in this area here, which is known as the Castles, and which the Scottish Mountaineering Club reckons is severe. People get killed up there quite often. So if you are going to try that, be careful how you do it. That's a granite, a major granite intrusion. There are other um, forms of volcanic activity in the island for which it's quite well known. Um, this is a dike swarm. Dikes are where you have volcanic intrusions up through pre-existing rocks which have got vertical cracks in them. And the magma comes up and fights its way up through the crack and up to ground level. And then very often the surrounding rocks get eroded because they're softer and you're left with this so-called dike swarm. And the other um, structure you get with that kind of intrusion is sill. This is where the magma is coming up through rocks which have got a horizontal gap between layers of rock and it's filled up by the uh, magma and it forms a sill. This is Drummadoon sill, the point at Drummadoon. And it's interesting because that is columnar basalt, and it is similar to uh, what you get at Staffa, and also um, to some extent the, the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. Another feature of Aran geology, uh, this is Hutton's unconformity. James Hutton is known as the father of Scottish geology. He, he noticed that a structure like this didn't sit comfortably with the theories that the earth was created from a great flood a la the bible and he said he was looking at this and you've got rocks which have been laid down and they have been twisted into that kind of angle 
And then on top of it, you've got other rocks which are completely different angle. And he worked out that that line there represented a considerable period of time. And that was sitting unconformably on this. And so you've got this evidence, which basically founded modern geology, because this is the point where we thought, oh no, um, Bishop Usher has got it wrong. Bishop Usher read the Bible and got largely got the chapter on the begats and decided that the earth was um, formed in the year 4004 BC. He was wrong. <laughs> so um, that's the other significant thing. So you move on to somewhat later and you get life beginning. Life begins in the seas. Well, we're not absolutely sure. You've got fossils being found, very, very, very primitive fossils in rocks that are as old as Precambrian, even Precambrian. But uh, in Aran, there's not very much um, fossiliferous material because it's been so violently um, volcanic. Um, we do have a little bit of, um, oh, what's the bit I want? Yes, Carboniferous. Little bit of Carboniferous um, things. And these are caves in Corrie. They're, they're not sea caves, but they're actually quarried out by people for limestone, which were used for um, fertilizing fields. But in these caves, we find this pretty fellow. And he is the most prominent fossil you will find in Aaron. We don't get many fossils. There's one or two little crinoids and odd things, but not very little fossiliferous material. However, what we do have quite a bit of, or a certain amount of, is fossil tracks. Not the animal, but the marks it left when it walked over a muddy patch. Um, these are quite famous, in fact. Um, the, <laughs> apparently there was one occasion when a, a university team came from somewhere in Germany and tried to actually chisel them out and blow them up and take them away. However, they were prevented. So this, this was a kind of beastie, which was a sort of millipede, um, giant miria pod. He was about two feet long, and apparently he had 22 pairs of legs. Um, so that's, he, he has left tracks. And then a bit later on, uh, somebody else left tracks. Uh, again, we don't have a fossil of this beast, but we do have a fossil of his footprints. And his footprints look like a human hand. And stretched out, and so he's known as the hand beast. And interestingly, his fossil is the first evidence of him was found near Levenkorach, which is one of the villages that we've um, surveyed with, with Agfa. Moving on, you get to the last ice age, and that was pretty good at wiping out virtually everything that went before. So you're kind of starting again when you get to the Ice Ages. There are geological features that are uh, very noticeable in Arran too. That's why we used to get geology students in the hundreds coming to Arran because it was so much so close. You have um, raised beaches. Um, my geology was done a long, long time ago and I may be out of date, but I was told there was a 15 foot beach, there was a 25 foot beach and there was a 100 foot beach and they're all shown here. You also get what you could call fossil caves. In other words, these were etched out by the sea at one time, but it is now well above sea level. The other another feature you get are gouged out U-shaped valleys. Originally that would be a kind of V-shape, the river running through it, but when the ice uh, builds up, it gouges out the whole area that's been used by the, the, the river valley, and you get what they call a U-shaped valley. And then scours out sand and what have you. It also carries quite big rocks up and down. And th these are called erratic blocks. I have to watch for the shade of Dr. Spooner at this point, because he called it something slightly different. So this is an erratic block. It's called the Cat Stone, and it's somewhere about Corrie. And it's of interest because it's an erratic block. 
It also has got a little bit more recent interest, which is it was the site of a skirmish between the Royalists and the Dan Royalists. And it's well known because somehow it's stuck in the memory. This is 16th century, but it's still stuck in the memory. And again, it became of interest because it became a bit political about 1950, 60. There was a roads engineer in Butte and he didn't like twisty roads. And so he decided that he was going to get rid of things that stopped him from having straight roads. He did manage to get the road from Brodick South straightened out, thereby destroying another geological feature, which is very rare, apparently, which is called a magmatic roll. And that is where you've had an outpouring of magma, which is almost hardened, but not quite. And then another outpouring comes and it slides along the front of the, the earlier one and it comes off in little rolls, little circular things like sort of cigars. And so they did that in the south side. This is the north side of Brodick and he wanted to blow this one up. So if you look on the other side, you will see three little round holes about an inch across. And that's where he was putting in his gunpowder and he was about to set it off. However, locals found out uh, Ducal House, Brodick Castle, found out, and there was one hell of a row. And the roads engineer was sent back to Butte with his tail between his legs. And you've got people. Um, once the ice retreated, we start to get evidence of people actually moving back into this area here. The, the earliest ones we know of are Mesolithic sites, and we've got sites at these various. Um, sections of the, the island. Uh, you've got stone and bone artifacts, shell middens and stone, so on. And you've got uh, sort of flint flakes, which may be used for knives or um, arrows or arrowheads, something like that. And I think it's interesting that um, there must have been an awful lot of them around because farmers in the 17th century, 18th century, were complaining that something would happen to their cattle. They would become lame and they called it, they said that the cattle had been elf shot. In other words, the fairies had shot them with these little flint arrowheads. In actual fact, the, the flint gets into the hoof and makes the beast lame, but it makes you wonder just how many flints were lying around in the 17th, 18th century. Uh, you move into the Neolithic and you've got some of the classic features of um, the, this period. We start with chambered cairns, of which we have 28, I think, um, extant. And there are some we know of which have been completely destroyed, so there were even more than that. Um, this is the Giant's Graves, just up above um, Whiting Bay. Uh, uh, the two cairns um, set at right angles to each other. Uh, this is the larger one, and attention is capstone. Uh, you'll see that it is covered in graffiti, quite old graffiti. I sometimes wonder if stone carving was part of what they taught in the schools in the Victorian period. Um, but I'm not. I want you to have a, a look at this corner here. It says, "In memory." Then there's a date, which you can't make out. And then there's seven names. And I think it's fascinating that you have a structure which we assume was ritual for burial and ritual religious purposes. And someone has, 5,000 years later, has come along and said, I am going to use this as a memorial for these people. The idea with the ritual significance was still powerful enough for somebody to be using it again in 5,000 years. What happened, I don't know. I've been on to the um, museum, you know, the archives. They can't think of any instance. It, I thought maybe it was a shipwreck, but they don't know of any shipwreck which had these names attached to it. Um, the only thing I can suggest is that Quite close by on the main road, there's a house called Spion Cop. And that was one of the major um, battles of the Boer War. And I'm wondering if these guys were island men who had been 
or volunteer had been drafted into the local regiment and been killed in the course of the Boer War. That, that's, that's just a wild guess with absolutely no evidence to back it up. But it's, it's, I, th I find it very interesting that somebody was still felt that there was religious significance to this site so much later. Another um, here, this is called Dunanbeg, and it is quite close to the Kilbride Chapel above uh, Lamnash. And it is a straightforward long cairn with the chambers at each end. It is close to, although not intervisible with, Dunan Moor. And Dunan Moor is a round cairn. But Dunan Moor has got Clyde type chambers, but not in a line. They are angled into the centre. And that, I'm given to understand, is pretty unusual. Very rare to find them in that structure. I have seen somebody speculating that this may have been the earlier form of the Clyde type cairn, and that somehow or other they got squashed together and the, the, the chambers got moved. But anyway, it's, it's interesting. And then there's Karma Home. This one's down to us, the south end. And this is a passage grave. Oh, it's very, very odd. It looks like a mini clava cairn. Um, but it also, I mean, 17 feet across. It's, it's tiny. And it has a projecting stone within the chamber. And I think, God, um, what are we looking at? Orkney Cromarty? It's as though somebody had been on holiday and thought, oh, I'll have a bit of that, and I'll have a bit of that, and I'll have a bit of that. It's, it's, it's weird, weird, weird. Uh, it, uh, we'll have a look at Glen Rickard. Glen Rickard is a standard long cairn, very, very um, robbed out, destroyed. In fact, Bryce didn't think it was worth excavating in 1900. Very, very robbed out. Um, but it's uh, just above Brodick, and it has... Uh, a ruined house quite close to it. Possibly the house was originally built from the cairn. But this ruined house is now very obviously ruined and couldn't possibly have anybody living in it. Yet, I spoke to someone who said he'd been up to have a look at the cairn. And it was a lovely day. And the bees were buzzing. And the birds were singing. And he got up to the top. And then suddenly it all went quiet. I thought, oh, and then a little old lady appeared at the door of this ruined cottage and she had a little dog with her and the little dog ran out and dropped her around the side and caught his leg on the standing stones and then ran back in again. She disappeared, the dog disappeared and then the bees started buzzing and the birds started singing. Uh, whether the fact that my informant was just out the 19th hole of Roddick Golf Course Maybe totally irrelevant. But obviously, another a major feature of the Neolithic, which we have in Arn, are stone circles. Not sure how many, but I do know that we've lost some of those. Macri, um, anyone that's been to Arn with the remotest interest in archaeology will have been to Macri. And if you haven't, get there. <laughs> um, there is one double circle, which is, um, well, supposed to be where Finn tethered his dog, Bran. But anyway, uh, so there's, there's one double circle, and double circles are pretty unusual. But we know there was another double circle at Sanox, but it was bulldozed by a local farmer 2000, 200 years ago. Um, there is one solitary standing stone left to mark its place. The reasons why things are the way they are just now, I find interesting that things have been done to get rid of a lot of material that we would like to have known about. So this is the, uh, one of the other circles at Macri, and it is one of the better known ones. And it, it's a nice instance of what's happened to a lot of the archaeology in Arne and elsewhere. Uh, people coming along much later said, oh, right, we've got um, nice granite stones in here alternating with the tall red sandstone ones so that could be useful we'll turn them into among other things um millstones only whoever was doing it either did something wrong or the stone was faulty and so it broke and they never took it away but it does tell us what was happening and this indicates that this stone this circle was originally red sandstone tall red sandstone 
not so tall white granite, red sandstone, white granite, red sandstone. And it's interesting if you then look at Ochagallan, which is on the east side of the island. This one, again, you've got red sandstone and granite. This one looks a bit like a recumbent. Lots of people say, oh, no, 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 it couldn't possibly be a recumbent. You won't get recumbents here. It looks a bit like a recumbent because this stone is jammed between the two sandstone ones, which is why it's still there. It hasn't been, they haven't been able to take it away. So again, you've got red sandstone, white granite, and this chap in Aberdeenshire who's been looking at the stone circles there, and he's beginning to think you're looking at symbolism, colour symbolism. You've got red sandstone, red for blood, red for fire, red for light, for sunlight, and you're contrasting that with white. So you're looking at ice and fire, something like that. There may be a significance to it. There may not, but it's I find it interesting. The other major um, thing to do with iron in the Neolithic, of course, is pitchstone. Pitchstone is a volcanic glass, um, usually very dark green or black, sometimes with little white inclusions. And there's a funny thing of pitchstone, it's possible apparently chemically to state exactly which outcrop any piece of pitchstone comes from. And the this particular, a lot of the iron pitchstone comes from quarry gills. And apparently there is almost nowhere else where you get pitchstone. I think you get some in Rome. But see, what we're finding is that um, the pitchstone was used for things like uh, tools, hammers, um, knives, all sorts of things like that. But this is volcanic glass. And the trouble is that if you <laughs> try and hit something with it, it will shatter. Um, so what on earth were they making tools out of volcanic glass for? And I find this absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's luxury goods for people to put in their metaphorical mantelpieces and say, oh, isn't that lovely? And, or, or show that I'm, I'm rich, I can afford to get fancy ties like this. You have a situation where there's a trade in luxury goods 2,000 years ago. Would you believe? It's amazing. One other thing, well, some other things we've got in Iran, we've got some rock art, not an awful lot, but quite um, clearly defined and quite complicated figures as well. Those of you who are in the rock art project will um, be able to evaluate it better than me. And then, of course, you're tending to move towards the um, Iron Age, you're, you're moving into the period of forts. And this is Dramadun Fort, the same Dramadun that is the Sill. Um, it's, it's, it's very large. And Hedrick, in about 1820, 1830, reports that there are house platforms on it, although nobody's been able to find them more recently, but it's probable that there were people living here either permanently or temporarily um, during the Iron Age. And of course, they were certainly farming because you can observe the, the rig on the hill there. That's the biggest fort in the island. This is the smallest fort in the island, King's Cross Fort, um, just beside Lamlash. Uh, and, and I don't quite know if it counts as a fort. It's very small. It um, was only about 20, I don't know, I can't remember quite the size of it, but it's uh, not very big. And it's, uh, yeah, here we are, 35 feet across. Um, it can hardly have been somewhere people lived or even stayed for any length of time. I think it must have been a kind of lookout point because it's looking over Lamlash Bay. And Lamash Bay is a wonderful harbour, best harbour in the island, best harbour in the Clyde. Um, so it was probably a lookout point. And this is a fort that was well up in Glen Ashdale. Um, 
I'm mentioning this because um, the Forestry Commission came along. 19, forestry started very early in Aaron, I think 1919, and they did quite a few plantings in very early years. And Glen Ashdale Fort was one of the places they planted in these very early years. And in the fullness of time, the trees grew and the trees were harvest, harvested. And when the trees were cut down and taken away, the Nashdale Fort reappeared. And I think it's an interesting commentary. When these, that bit was planted, the system was that a man came along with a little dipper, he dug a little hole and he planted his tree. You didn't have massive trenching machines which wreck any archaeology at all. This, once you got rid of the trees, the fort was re revealed. Not quite as it was, but with quite enough information for you to be able to look at it and read it and understand it. So there are some other features. Um, we've got some round houses. That one's a very modern one. <laughs> the rangers built that one. This one's way up in the hills, very high, uh, higher than normally you'd expect. So unless it was um, an early version of transhumans, don't know. But we do have, oh, we have loads and loads and loads of roundhouses. And I should imagine that the LIDAR survey is producing many, many more. Um, besides roundhouses, we've got, they found a souterrain um, when they were rebuilding the um, school in the Nash. We've got castles, we've got Brodick, Lochranza, and Kildonan. And I always look at Kilpatrick Doon and think, I wonder if that started life as a broch. Um, then, of course, when you consider the LIDAR survey, we have added to that um, a Cursus monument. So I think you'll agree that <coughs> archaeology in Ireland is fairly spectacular. Talked about the Iron Age. The funny thing about the Iron Age in Iron is that there are no Romans. There is not a trace, any evidence whatsoever that they ever set foot in the island, which is odd because they must have known it was there. The, the, the Romans were at well, the end of the Antonine Walls, the Firth of Clyde. Um, they have, there's evidence that the Roman pottery was found in Dumbarton. Um, they must have passed it, they must have seen it, but it's not, they, nobody landed, nobody left any remains anyway. And as far as I know, it's not mentioned in any of the literature. So, very odd. So we'll move on to the Celtic period and the Celtic Church. And Holy Island. Celtic Church was quite widespread in the island. There's lots of saints' names, Kilbride and Kilmory are the two um, parishes. Um, and then you come to Holy Island. And it's so-called, well, initially it was um, used by a priest, a, an Irish priest, called St. Molesh, and he came to live as a hermit on the island for a number of years, I think it was 12, 14, something like that. Um, he then left and became a bishop in Ireland, um, and quite prominent in the Celtic church. But I, I always look on as a bit of a baddie, because he supported the Roman rite, not the Celtic church at the Vineyard Center for Whitby. Right. Uh, the Holy Island. So Molly Irish lived here in a cave on the Holy Island. Um, and uh, there are carvings, there are, uh, apparently carvings of Christian crosses can be dated by the style. And these are early ones, probably contemporary with him. Um, but he was there in until about 6.30, something, something like that. And then there's a bit of a gap until you get to the 13th century. And apparently at that time, uh, John, Lord of the Isles, founded a monastery on the island. And it was um, looked, it was not successful. And in the 16th century, middle of the 16th century, a traveler called Dean Monroe um, 
saw it that says that it's decayed and it certainly wasn't really functioning in any way by his time in the middle of the 16th century. However, it had a cemetery and people in Ireland, certainly on the east side of the island, were uh, using that cemetery for reasons because it was so holy, apparently. Um, and that carried on until the middle of the 19th century, when, uh, unfortunately, a party of mourners were taking over somebody deceased to be buried in this graveyard, and the ship was swamped and quite a number of people were drowned. So that stopped in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, however, uh, the, the graveyard disappeared, it's completely disappeared, but if you go to the south end of the island and look up behind the lighthouse, you will find a kind of wall made of these slabs. Almost looks like Caithness stone, but it's not. I think these are the grave markers from the old medieval cemetery, which have been reused at some point, possibly early 20th century, to make a kind of fence uh, to mark off the, the the lighthouse from the wild goats and things that were on the island at the time. Um, it, you will see that this particular stone has been decorated and that is where we move up to the Buddhists. Um, they uh, bought the island in 1990. They are the Buddhists from um, the Sami Ling Monastery in Dumfrieshire but they, they came up about 90, bought it in 1990 and started moving in in the first couple of years. And they, they, one of the things they did was to put depictions of sacred images and also Buddha and so on, on various things throughout the island. Some of the, the locals were complaining it's a bit irreligious, a bit disrespectful, but I don't think it matters much. Um, uh, I was over there with some folk from um, the heart. We did a quick survey before the Buddhists got tore in because they were, they were well, in fact, they, they did actually knock down the old farmhouse and build a new retreat house. And um, they dug up the cemetery and planted an orchard in it and something like that. So we wanted to have a quick look before they did. And um, I remember meeting um, Lama Yeshi, who was the sort of heat bummer uh, on the island. And he was all done up in his saffron robes. And I thought, oh, how, how exotic, how romantic. And he had this little bag tied to his waist. And I thought, oh, I wonder what he keeps in that. I wonder if it's incense or something. I don't know whatever Buddhists do. Um, well, I watched, wondered that until the little bag rang. And then I discovered he was using it to hold his mobile phone. <laughs> So that's, um, let's go back to the Celtic area. And the next thing that happened was that the Vikings appeared. Um, there is hardly any evidence of the Vikings on Arden in terms of archeology, span in terms of something you can actually touch. Um, there is a grave at King's Cross, and this was excavated and a coin uh, dating from the middle of the 9th century was found, so we reckon this is probably middle, 9th to 10th century, this period, this, this, this grave. Um, the grave uh, is the only bit of construction on the island that we have from the Vikings. Although we know there was a similar grave on the other side of Lamlash Bay, uh, which was destroyed in late 19th century, so somebody could do that with you. <clears throat> so there may have been a few more. Um, the, the Viking grave isn't quite as obvious as something like a chamber cairn, so they may have been ploughed out or whatnot. But in any case, the only thing we have in the ground is one grave. And the other thing we have are runes. There are, the, the, these ruins are on the roof of um, St. Malicious Cave on Holy Island. Um, they are of varying um, periods and they frequently say something profound like um, Vladimir was here or something like that. 
But there is one, um, and it's interesting because it says Vigleicher the Marshal had this carved. And we think this Vigleicher was one of the admirals of King Håkon of Norway when Håkon came to try to recover the Western Isles from Scotland in fought the Battle of Largs in 16, no, 1263 and was roundly defeated uh, and, and, and left. But we think that is that Vic Liker. So he was obviously Viking too. But those are the only two things on the island that I know of that will tell you Vikings were there, except for place names. Uh, there are place names of Viking origin. Uh, place, place names um, like Sanux, uh, Glenashdale, Brodick. Uh, Glenashdale is an interesting word because it is a Gaelic component, it's got an English component and it's got a Norse component. I don't know what that says about language. And then you have place names which are named after people, Scaftigal, Glen Chalmadil, Glen Scoradil. And then you have names which look Gallic, but are Gallic translations of Norse rentals. Fairlen is Farthing, Penrich is Penny, Dippen, um, another site that we've surveyed, Tuppany, Tuppany Lands, and then Levin Corach, which is Hapney. So the Vikings not only were in the island, they seemed to have owned or, or ruled most of the island for some period, not a hugely long period, because when you move into the later medieval period, you've basically got Scots. Whether these are the same descendants of the Vikings or whether the Vikings packed in and went away, I do not know. One of those places with a Viking name is Glen Scorridale. And... Uh, if you had visited Glens Corridale in 1960 or so, 60, 65, and gone into the farm here, which had a little tea room, you could have ordered tea and buns, and they might have been served to you by the teenage son of the family, uh, whose name was Jack McConnell, and who subsequently became First Minister of Scotland and is now Baron McConnell of Glens Corridale. Moving on again, uh, I don't intend to do anything about this. I find it horrendously complicated. Uh, we're just going to pick up one or two little things that I think are curious. Uh, the cave's cave. Um, most people think of this as Bruce, and this cave is one of the 761 places where Bruce watched the spider. Um, but in fact, uh, it most unlikely Bruce was here. We know Bruce was on the island. Uh, we think he was on the other side of the island, watching for a signal from the mainland. Um, the, or, the first reference to this area as Bruce's caves or the King's caves comes from Sir Walter Scott, actually. Um, prior to that, the locals called it Fingal's Cave. So Bruce was here, but not there. Uh, I mentioned castles. Uh, and castles were very much involved in all the struggles in this period. But the odd thing about Arran, it's got a castle at Roddick, it's got a castle at Ranza, it had a castle at Kildonan. Although if you want to see it, you better get over there quickly because it is rapidly falling down. Um, but this, you should have won at Lamlash because Lamlash has got this fabulous harbour. You'd think there would be a castle there to act as a guard, lookout, whatever. And yet there's no record of a castle ever being there. But if you then have a look at sort of past history and various accounts, you'll find that um, there's a record of Henry VIII of England being advised by a spy in about 1583, this is when he had the rough wing and was trying to get his son married to um, Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, that spy is advising Henry that there are two castles in Lamlash, one on the mainland, one on the island. Um, 
the one on the island, I suspect, is underneath the lighthouse. The one on the mainland, he said, is where this building was built. This building was built early 18th century, and when it was built, there's a record that they found the foundations of a very large building underneath. Um, and when they were doing some work on it in the 19th century, you're getting drains built and so on, um, they found uh, there was evidence of a sort of harbour slipway thing and an iron um, anchor was found. And it appears that this thing, which is called the White House, which was built by the Duke for his dowager mother, as I say, about 1820, this appears to have been built on the site of Lamlash Castle, which must have existed, must have existed. So uh, moving on to the mentioned the religious wars, the wars, the religious wars or dif differences of opinion or what have you, went right on until very, very recently. In fact, the last fuss that this, the we freeze were making was about 20 years ago only. So um, the result of the um, separation of the church from the Church of Scotland and all the rest of it in the 19th century um, was that every village has got at least two and sometimes three churches, each of which is capable of holding all the people in the village at any time. Um, so you have a plethora of churches. You had um, schisms and, and breakaway groups wanting to have a place of their own to worship. And so an interesting um, thing developed in the 19th, well, maybe 18th century. Um, you could get a catalogue and order what we would call a flat pack church. And this is one example of that strange development. Uh, this is the church in Pern Mill. And originally it was ordered and bought and paid for and put up by the Free Church on the island. But the Free Church on the island has shrunk so much that they can't really keep this going. And I think it's a nice irony that it is now let to the Church of Scotland. Um, but the tin church is, is one. There's a man just done a survey of all the tin churches in Scotland. And there's a surprising number. Uh, Brodie Castle is, is quite interesting when you stand and look at it because it kind of encapsulates the history. And it does it in a sort of linear progression. There's your Victorian bit. Uh, and then the next bit was from the Cromwellian, Cromwell, Cromwellian period um, when they had soldiers billeted in the castle and he built this uh, for his troops. Well, he, he wasn't there, but um, the, the Cromwellian government arranged for that. And then here you have the rent of a, a much earlier period and then you've got a battery for the, the guns that Cromwell brought up. So you've got the whole history kind of in, in one piece. So leaving aside the political history, we move to another aspect of history. It was a very sad aspect of history, but you know. Um, the clearances in Aaron weren't as savage as elsewhere, uh, but they were still pretty devastating and whole villages disappeared. The whole Gallic culture was totally undermined. So you have villages that were completely cleared. Um, this is one in the north end, this is Lagan, and this is one also in, above Glen Sanox, and this is North Glen Sanox. Both of these were cleared about 1829, and most of the people in these two villages um, were encouraged to um, embark for Nova Scotia. The Duke arranged for them to have land waiting for them in Nova Scotia. Um, <laughs> and he generously paid half the fee on the ship that took them there. Not all of it, but half of it. Um, however, when they got there, there wasn't as much land as they thought, and the land was heavily forested. So it, it took a great deal of hard labour and virtually starvation for them to be able to um, turn it into 
a, a new settlement. Um, those were villages that were completely cleared and destroyed. But some villages were either were destroyed, but the landowner gave them a new place to stay. This is the um, Twelve Apostles at Catacom. It's one of the very photogenic bits of yeah, everybody goes down and sees the Twelve Apostles. Um, allegedly, the, 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 they were cleared from um, Catacom, which is just down here. And the idea was that they would um, become fishermen. Uh, and alle allegedly, each of these windows in the upper floors is very subtly different. And that's supposed to be so that the housewife could put a candle in the window and the men coming back from the fishing would know that uh, that was where they were and uh, who was, you know, that the wife was waiting for them. Um, but when Mr. Weston Ra built his new village for his villagers, they were a bit miffed and they flatly refused to move in and these houses lay empty for two years. They're now very, very desirable, you see. <laughs> This is uh, an amalgamation of pictures from Levencora, which is a site that we surveyed in 2005. And it's another village that people were cleared into. Uh, it's not easy to see, but uh, this is the sea here at the back. And you're looking at a very steep hill, uh, which takes you down to the shore. And yet they were supposed, these two were supposed to make a living as fishermen. Um, must have been a nightmare. The land is not terribly useful for ploughing and so on. We had a village which was built on this bare hillside. Initially, the houses were built gable end onto the sea, as was the traditional way. And then at some later period, these houses were more or less knocked down, rebuilt um, parallel to the sea. Um, and then these houses were abandoned and another lot of new houses were built in front of them. So there's actually three phases of this village in a relatively short period, maybe 150 years. Um, and some of the houses, the Victorian houses at the front are still occupied. Uh, this is a memorial to the clearances, which was paid for and caused to be erected by the descendants of the people from North Sanox and Lagan who were sent across the sea. Um, and it's been planked in front of Hamilton Terrace, which was built by the Duke of, uh, um, Duke of Hamilton in um, um, 1895. So the Ducal family weren't too chuffed about this landing in front of it. But um, uh, now I'm going to very quickly have a look at what people did for a living. Obviously, the major one was um, farming or crofting. Um, but a, the Duchess Anne, the good Duchess Anne in the 17th century, um, she was very, very people oriented and she tried to get things done that would enable people to have an income, have a, a decent living and so on. And she opened up a uh, coal mine and uh, at Lagan in the North End. And again, there was a tiny, tiny strip of Carboniferous um, outcrop. Um, the masses of Carboniferous stuff and coal seems on the mainland close by, but not very much here. So she found this one and it was opened up. Um, and the idea was to uh, use the coal to fuel salt pans and then be able to um, sell the salt and export and so on. So that's the site of the, the mine and the salt pans. Uh, to help with this particular project, she also arranged for a harbour to be built at Lamlash. And this was 17th century, but if you walk along the front at Lamlash at a very low tide, you will see the remains of Duchess Anne's harbour in the, in the bay. 
Then round about 1780, this is a pern mill which was used to create perns, wooden bobbins, for the thread trade in the cotton industry in Paisley. And that functioned for 60 years. It was closed down. They'd, they'd really run out of wood to make the bobbins and it would be too expensive to import. So that died. There was a local slate mine, slate quarry. The slates were used on the island, but it wasn't export. And, and then there was fishing, which was another major activity of the islanders. Now, the, the nets were made of cotton and were liable to rot very easily. So to try and preserve them, they were dipped in vats of bark juice. Um, the, the, a, lot of, a lot of it was imported from India, where it was a particular kind of tree and a most efficacious bark. But basically what they were doing was dipping them in vats of this juice from the bark of these trees. And uh, the this, this process was known as barking. And there were special places built to do this because you wanted somewhere you could have your big vat. I mean, they were huge. They were about four or five feet high. And you wanted somewhere where you were at this, your feet were at the level of the open the mouth of the vat. And it would be, um, then you, you would be able to work on it. Uh, this is an old photograph. You will not see this now. You will see a house where this whole area has collapsed in the middle. It was not looked after and it's very, very annoying. Um, there's much more ruined remains of another one over at Catacomb. And this is the um, varieties mine at Sanox. Um, and there's quite a lot of this still to see. If you go up Glen Sanox, you can see there is a fair amount of stuff. This was rather later. Um, you had 1840, the mine was opened. Then it was closed after 20 years because the Duke thought it spoiled the view. But then it was opened again after the First World War and ran for the interwar period when the, the veins petered out. Varieties is used in paint making, in cement, um, using a kind of coating for paper. And, and, and oddly enough, it's used more, much more recently, varieties is used in a whole range of um, plastic materials, which had they been there at the time, they might have been able to keep it open, but never mind. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is tourism. Um, this again is Hamilton Terrace. When this house was built, these little houses have outside and quite separately an even smaller house in the back garden. And the reason for this was that in the 18th, 19th century, you had a situation where wealthy glass regions would take a house for the summer, two, three months. The locals moved out the big house into the little house and the visitors got the big house. And the father of the family would commute on the, on the boats. So this was um, very common. There are lots of houses. In fact, my own house in Waiting Bay has a little house at the end that the family moved into um, for, the, for the summer. Very quick look at some locals. Daniel McMillan, who founded, the, he was born in a little croft at Lagan. He founded the publishing firm and his grandson was Harold McMillan, who became prime minister. Uh, Flora Drummond uh, was brought up in the island. She was a suffragette, very, very um, aggressive, militant, um, and known as the general. And apparently she used, used to lead bands of ladies into action on horseback. Amazing one. Um, this is Robert McLennan, poet, playwright, author of the Linmill stories, and very successful. He lived in High Corrie. And Donald McKelvey was quite well known as a potato breeder. Donald's bred potatoes at oh, the beginning of the 20th century, and he managed to get rid of various problems. He was very successful. And his potatoes were all named uh, after Aaron something. So he had an Aaron Victory, Aaron Banner, Aaron Chieftain. These are all varieties of his potatoes. 
And that leads you on to the local newspaper, which is in the Iron Book of Records for two reasons. One is it's got the best saturation coverage of any local paper. Everybody in the island reads the banner. Not everybody buys it, but everybody reads it. And the other thing about it is that it's the only newspaper in the world named after a potato. Other locals, seals, and these ones like to hang out in the golf course. So, quick squint through Aaron and just finish off with a murder mystery. Uh, there were two gentlemen who met each other in Rothsey, as it happens, and um, they went to Aaron and they took lodgings together and they decided to go up Boat Fell. One of them was called Edwin Rose, a clerk from London, and the other was called John Laurie from uh, the mainland of Scotland. Uh, Laurie, well, Rose disappeared and was found um, a few hours, several hours later, dead up high on Glen Rosa. Uh, Laurie disappeared. Um, Rose's um, stick and coat were nearby, but um, he didn't have any boots on. And the, he, he had injuries consistent with either a fall or being hit by um, heavy, heavy stones. Rose went on the run and was actually found to have some of Rose's... Um, Laurie went on the run, found to have some of Rose's property and was arrested and charged with murder. He admitted to theft, but said he didn't murder Rose, that Rose had fallen and died. Um, he was found guilty by eight to seven. Eight people found him guilty, seven of them found it not proven. There was quite a bit of doubt. So although he was uh, sentenced to death, it was commuted. And so he um, ended up uh, living in Perth prison for, I think, about 43 years the longest serving prisoner at that time in Scotland. Uh, he was a model prisoner. Apparently they'd got to the stage where they turned him out after breakfast and he walked around Perth until tea time and then came back. So that's the story of the Aaron murder. Uh, they went up down and Aaron Rose then died. A very um, violent, probably painful death, but at least he now lies in a peaceful and very, very beautiful place in the old cemetery at the mouth of Glen Sanlux. So that's my story of Adam. <laughs>